Okay, welcome back everyone for Civilizations of the Andes as we continue to compare the commonalities and variations of Africa and the Americas. Okay. Uh, the rich marine environment of the Andes possess an endless supp supply of seabirds and fish uh, that were available to the civilizations there. And the most well-known civilization of the region was the Incas uh, because that was the time of uh, the Europeans' discovery of the Americas. But there are some other civilizations that we're going to look at today. And the central Peruvian coast was home to one of the first civilizations, Norte Chico. Um, and from 1000 BC to about 1000 CE, different civilizations rose and fell. And that's what we're going to take a look at. <clears throat> Let's start with the Shavin. Uh, there's a, numerous ceremonial centers that were uncovered. Here, dating to uh, one, or excuse me, 2000 to 1000 BCE, and around 900 BCE, Chavín de Huantar became the focus of a religious movement, and it was well located along trade routes. Um, there was an elaborate temple complex, and historians believe that the residents' beliefs drew apparently um, on both desert region and the rainforest, and they probably used the hallucin hallucinogenic San Pedro cactus. So a number of ritual sites and temple complexes uh, developed in the Andes, and Chavín de Huatar became the focal point. It had a population um, of about 2,000 to 3,000 by 750 BCE, with a distinct social hierarchy, and the elite lived in stone homes while the commoners had adobe homes, and they built these elaborate and complex temples at this site. And there was widespread imitation of the civilization across Peru and even beyond, uh, but they didn't necessarily become an empire as it faded by uh, 200 BCE. Um, so artwork shows that the temple complex had connections to all directions in the high and lowlands of Peru. Uh, even animals from the lowlands were represented as gods and sacred figures. But by about 200 BCE, the civilization kind of just faded out. Okay, let's talk about the moche. Um, the, the moche flourished between about 100 and 800 CE, so it's a little bit later than the Chavín, um, along the 250 miles of the northern coast of Peru. Now, their agriculture was based on a complex irrigation system, but they also relied on fishing. Um, there's rule by warrior priests. Um, some even lived on top of these huge pyramids, rituals um, that involved meditating between g humans and gods, and they also used hallucinogenic drugs, um, performed human sacrifice, and um, rulers had uh, these elite, or excuse me, elaborate burials uh, done for them. <clears throat> now the Moche, um, they, they were superb craftsmen, um, of elite objects and very fine things and tools, but there's an ecological disruption about the 6th century CE that undermined the civilization and thus um, it faded. So about 250 miles off the coast, um, these 13 river valleys made up this coastal population center. Um, the religious military elites were very wealthy and presided over human sacrifice. There are graves of elites from the period um, that show a lot of material wealth. And the rich fisheries and the river-fed irrigations um, led to abundant sardines and other fish of this part of the Pacific that provided a great source of food. And the rivers um, fed the irrigation systems in what would be otherwise uh, rather dry and barren lands. And the guano from the coastal inlands was used as fertilizer. And the fine crafts... Um, were from the metal workers, potters, and weavers. Um, oh, sorry, let's go back. Um, and they left artifacts showing some rather sophisticated skills. But like I said, this there's an ecological disruption. Uh, some believe that this fragile environment, because it's prone to earthquakes and droughts and floods, that there was some type of a, a crisis in the 5th century, or excuse me, 6th century um, CE. And so the Moche civilization collapsed. 
So let's look at the Wari and Tiwanaku. Um, about this civilization flourished between 400 and 1000 CE up in the Andean Highlands. Um, and it was centered on these larger urban capitals. There was a lot of monumental architecture, um, populations in the tens of thousands, and the empires included lower elevations of the eastern and western Andean slopes uh, and highlands. And they were all linked by caravan trade. And the influence over the capital city um, as a cultural and religious center also tied it all together. Um, but their cultural influence went beyond just what, what was there at the state. Um, they didn't control continuous bands of territory, but the capital city uh, set up colonies in the western and eastern lowlands, giving them access to distinct ecological zones. And between the two, though, there was little conflict uh, between the Wari and the Tumanaku. Uh, the Wari used uh, terraced agriculture, while the Tumanaku um, used raised field systems. And the Wari cities uh, were built... Uh, along this common plain and linked by the highways that really suggest a tighter political control. Um, very little overt um, conflict and warfare between the two uh, civilizations. Despite their border, there wasn't much mingling. Um, and a collapse of both civilizations about the same time as well, around 1000 CE. Um, and thus a series of smaller kingdoms developed after, and the Inca drew on these earlier states, and these earlier civilizations, to build a rather large empire. And so the two civilizations developed different agricultural styles and state systems, but there was little conflict um, along some of 300 mile shared border. And they shared re related cultural and religious systems, but spoke distinct languages. Um, and like I said, around 1000 was the collapse, but this was the basa, basis for the Inca that we see uh, about 500 years later. Uh, these states collapsed, broke into smaller kingdoms, but um, their state system, their highways, and their styles of dress and art um, really influenced the Inca in later centuries. Okay, and here is uh, a map showing you these different civilizations, you see the Moche and the Chimu up here, right? And in green is the Wari, and the purple are the Tiwanaku, and you can see um, this is the Tiwanaku core area, but their influence spread south um, and just a little east. But this is a large border right here. Um, through, uh, or between the Wari and the Tiwanaku through right there in the middle of the two of them. So, um, that was that shared border. And there, like I said, there wasn't much interaction between the two civilizations. Um, but, you know, and they developed very distinctly from one another. Uh, and if any of you are familiar with the Nazca Lines, that's where those are located. Um, the, uh, the Nazca Lines are these huge pictures um, that have been uh, carved into the rock up in these higher elevations and they're so huge that you have to be hundreds of feet in the air to see them. Uh, it's really neat. Um, I suggest googling the Nazca Lines and they're, most of the, the images are animals but what's really neat is that a lot of the lines are straight. So it's really neat to look at. Um, and like I said, you have to be hundreds of feet in the air to even uh, to even see what the images are. That's how big they are. Okay, and here's one of uh, the burial sites that I talked about. How cool is this? This is amazing. Um, so this is an archaeological discovery um, on Peru's northern coast. It shows the grave of a Moche ruler, um, whom historians have called the Lord of Sapan, because the grave site is close to the, uh, the town of Sapan. And at the center of this grave lies the Moche ruler, right, in a rather oversized coffin, especially compared to the others. I mean, placed around his coffin are four smaller casts with barely decorated skeletons. You can see that he's got a lot more uh, decor than these other four. 
and their uh, coffins are considerably smaller. So what does this grave tell us about the Moche civilization and its visions of the afterlife? Well, clearly, societies in the Moche civilization adhered to strict hierarchies, right, bestowing to their lord's supreme power that would explain the burial of nine more people along with Lord Sapan, which you can't see in this picture, but there are even more that are buried with him. And the central position of his coffin and his rich decoration also highlight his supreme status in this burial site. The Moche people must have had very concrete notions of life after death. Apart from the ten bodies that were found at this site, there was an ample amount of food in the grave. Uh, the lumber exposed on both sides of the grave suggests that the burial site included some type of a roof or covering. Uh, and the role of the different members of the burial group are believed to be a guard, a priest, a dog, uh, three young women. And that suggests that the people who were buried with the Lord expected his life to continue long after uh, death. And they wanted to ensure that he enjoyed all the privileges and the same status that he had in his lifetime. So how do you think the three young women got into the grave? Well, it's fair to assume that all other members of this burial community were killed and made to accompany the Lord of Sepan. The three young women may have very well have been human sacrifices, and who knows, they could have been buried alive. Um, but nonetheless, this is a fantastic archaeological discovery. Um, how amazing is that? And that's the conclusion of our Andes Civilizations uh, study. And I will see you guys again for... Uh, civiliza or the alternatives of civilizations, and we'll start with the Bantu and then on to North America.